When you look across the landscape of the modern-day United States of America, the actual footprints of the Wild West are few and far between. The Industrial Revolution truly changed the iconography and images of American frontiers, infrastructures, and communities at large. That being said, not all that existed during the earliest eras in United States history are merely left in the dust of a more modern age. Ghost towns, especially those of long-forgotten Western settlements, are perfectly picturesque replicas of the spaces we once occupied all across the Great Plains and beyond. In a way, ghost towns from the Wild West are the best-preserved footprints of the frontier we now only experience through textbooks and encyclopedias. Their crumbling architecture and wayward atmospheres now the symbol of the period's makeshift attitudes. If one thing is for certain, it's that with every ghost town comes an incredibly rich story full of both optimistic beginnings and haunted endings, much like the general history of the Wild West itself. To gain a better picture of the types of ghost towns still left unpopulated across the barren, dusty plains born of the American frontiers yesteryear, here are three fascinating ghost towns with a deep connection to the Wild West. The Ballad of Buckskin Joe takes us back in time to the Western Kansas Territory and Southwestern Nebraska Territory in July 1858 in an area of the United States once known as Pikes Peak Country, during the gold prospecting boom now referred to as the Colorado Gold Rush in present-day Colorado. First called Pikes Peak Gold Rush, the get-rich-quick phenomenon came nearly an entire decade after the first major gold rush in American history, nominally known as the California Gold Rush. However, the true beginnings of Pikes Peak came in 1835, when a French trapper named Eustace Carrier accidentally detracted himself from his traveling party and got lost in the southern Rocky Mountains. He meandered the terrain for days, and near the end of his miserable trek, he stumbled upon what he could only imagine was gold. Once Eustace made his way out of the Rockies and found a charitable ride south into the deserts of what is present-day New Mexico, he found a petrologist and asked him to examine the discovered minerals. When the examination was finalized, the petrologist informed Eustace he had brought back, in his own words, pure gold. It didn't take long for word to spread like wildfire in that nondescript New Mexico settlement. Eventually, Eustace rounded up an expedition force to head back up through the Red Rock Canyons and into the Southern Rocky Mountains, a journey so saturated with optimism, the dangers that lurked within the desert shadows never phased the party. And it was probably that same unbridled optimism that swept the mind of Eustace Carrier clean when he was unable to properly retrace his steps and return to the gold deposit he had wandered into. Nevertheless, the expedition force broke up and went their separate ways, but the rumors of a mineral-rich wonderland hiding in the Southern Rockies went with them as well. The rumors ran rampant at first, but dissolved after a few unsuccessful mining surveys came back empty-handed. That is, until 1849 gave way to 1850, and the California Gold Rush saw another massive influx of gold-famished mining parties traverse through the Southern Rockies on their way to California country. These miners caught wind of tired gossip regarding the gold in the nearby mountains and panned traces of the precious metal in the stream stemming from the South Platte River Valley. However, the gold didn't satiate the greedy thirst of the California-bound miners and the hidden deposits flurried throughout present-day Colorado Territory again went unnoticed. Another seven years or so passed on by, and the heat from the California Gold Rush cooled off. Few miners with the same ambition remained in the Rockies, and almost all hope was lost until a newly inspired Spanish-speaking party from New Mexico stumbled upon gold after establishing placer deposits in the South Platte River. Around the same time, a gold miner from Georgia by the name of William Greenberry Russell heard through the grapevine from his Cherokee wife that her tribe had also been aware of gold in the South Platte River Valley, and brought Russell and his mining party in February of 1858 to join in on the operation. Their hard work went unrewarded until later that summer in 1858, when Russell and his fellow miner Sam Bates placer mined 622 grams of solid gold from a small tributary along the Southern Platte River called Little Dry Creek. This was the largest amount of gold ever produced from the Southern Rocky Mountains, and the excitement grew throughout their Western territories. With the freshly found gold and plenty of it to boot, settlements along the base of the Rocky Mountains popped up tenfold. 
These rickety outposts and inspired towns stretched from the mountains of Golden City in modern-day Breckenridge, Colorado, to the woodlands in present-day Alma, Colorado. One such settlement came about in 1859. After a prospector named Mr. Phillips filed a mining claim in an area about two miles west of Alma, a small mining camp was born from his footsteps. Upon closer observation, however, Mr. Phillips felt the claim wouldn't serve his financial interests and left the territory almost as fast as he had arrived. Surprisingly enough, the mining camp didn't depart as a result and a legendary miner by the name of Joseph Higginbottom took over the claim. Mr. Higginbottom was most thought of in regards to the buckskin clothing he adorned and was given the name Buckskin Joe by his fellow gold seekers at the camp. One day in mid-1859, Buckskin Joe panned the riverbed of Buckskin Creek, a water source sitting eastward of the Mosquito Range of the Rocky Mountains in western Kansas Territory. There, he found further traces of gold, and the mining camp soon dispatched word that the immediate area was most likely a promised land riddled with hidden riches. If gold were to be had, however, Buckskin Joe wouldn't hang around to see the day. Strapped with whiskey debts due to his alcoholic tendencies, Buckskin Joe gave up the water rights of his mining claim and trekked the San Juan Mountains after selling off his panned gold for a horse and a firearm. Despite Buckskin Joe's disappearing act, the rest of the mining camp banded together as more and more workers joined the community and more claims were handed in. As the claims bore profitable results, the camp flourished into a vibrant settlement by spring of 1860. With the influx of miners came a much more robust mining operation. Sluice boxes lined the Buckskin Creek Riverbed, and a mill was constructed near the mining deposits. By September, enough of the population had come together to form an official town, quickly called Buckskin Joe, named after the man who truly brought the first real mining commune together and struck gold. The early days of Buckskin Joe's tenure saw 2,000 men populate the town. At first, there were only two women living in the town, sisters known as Laura and Jeanette Dodge. A few townsfolk attempted to legalize the town's name as Laurette, a portmanteau of the sisters' names. But the name Buckskin Joe had already stuck and those aware of its status never looked back. By August of 1861, Buckskin Joe featured an official post office, two hotels, and 14 stores, including Horace and Augusta Tabor's widely successful general store. The couple didn't take long to extend their reach throughout the town, and Horace obtained the title of postmaster, after being a welcomed investor into the gold mine affairs. There has long been stories told that Horace's wife, Augusta, was the true operator of Buckskin Joe's post office. However, being a woman, she was not allowed to legally hold the postmaster title, a disturbing yet accurate microcosm of the trials women faced when seeking equality on the American frontier. Another heavily discussed tale of a Buckskin Joe female pioneer is the legend of Silver Heels. Silver Heels was an anonymous dance hall girl who arrived in Buckskin Joe in 1861. She wasn't familiar with any of the inhabitants of the mining camp, but drew them in with her unflappable dancing skills and arresting performances. She knew how to express herself through the art of dance and provided Buckskin Joe with entertainment unseen in the newly founded Colorado Territory. When she first arrived, Silver Heels only intended to stay for a few nights of dancing before taking off for the next town over. Yet the insistence to stay by the local miners was enough to convince her to make Buckskin Joe her new home, and she accepted the gifts of her neighbors with much admiration. This admiration turned to courage, though, when in the winter of 1861, the smallpox virus ravaged through Buckskin Joe. Men were dropping like flies both at home and in the mines, dying at rates so high the cemetery couldn't bury them all in time before a mound of corpses lay at the graveyard's hillside. Of course, the townsfolk attempted to alert a nursing network in present-day Denver, Colorado, but due to the staff shortages and the impact of the smallpox disease at large, no one answered the call. That is, no one except Silverheels. The former dance hall girl rolled up her sleeves and ventured from mining cabin to mining cabin, making sure the sick were cared for, their families properly fed, and the dead respectfully buried. Eventually, the spring of 1862 arrived, and the smallpox virus once rampant in Buckskin Joe fizzled out. But from the ashes, Silver Heels could not be found. The woman who single-handedly saved hundreds of lives and looked after hundreds of others was gone in the blink of an eye. Fellow miners arrived at her cabin in town, but couldn't find a trace of her. The entire residence was cleaned, as if Silver Heels signaled she wasn't coming back. Stagecoaches and horse stables reported that no woman had left by way of carriage or horseback, 
making the disappearance of Silver Heels just as legendary as her unexpected heroics. The following rumors flowed faster than the floodgates could hold them. Some believed at the very end of the smallpox pandemic, Silver Heels fell ill with a virus. While she didn't perish, the story goes that the disease did leave vicious scars across the dance girl's face, and she left to start a new life as her entertaining days were surely over. A few years after the ordeal, Buckskin Joe citizens claimed to see Silver Heels watching over the local cemetery she once helped organize, disguised by a thick veil to hide her scars. The woman was never tracked down, however, and all that was left was a legend. And yet, the brilliant impact Silver Heels left on the folks of Buckskin Joe was not forgotten. In her honor, the townsfolk named a nearby mountaintop after her famous moniker called Mount Silver Heels. There were a few Buckskin Joe faithful, though, that weren't convinced Silver Heels was completely missing. They felt her spirit had returned to their Colorado mining camp, walking along the cemetery at night with flowers in her arms, the black veil still wrapped around her head. Folklore has it that if spoken to or approached, the ghost of Silver Heels will evaporate into the crisp Rocky Mountain air, but that she'll never abandon the souls of those she bridged to the afterlife. Silver Heels wouldn't be the only spirit to reportedly linger around the soon-to-be ghost town either. There's also the fantastical tale of J. Dawson Hitchpath, an unfortunate miner who fell from Mount Boss to his death near Buckskin Joe in July of 1865. When Hitchpath's mangled body was discovered, it was buried in the town cemetery. Yet not long afterwards, skeletal remains of the miner were horrifically found on the bed of a sex worker in Alma, two miles down the road. When the bones were attempted to be reburied, they were found yet again on the bed of a sex worker, but this time in Buckskin Joe itself. Eventually, everyone in the Colorado Territory knew about the cursed bones of J. Dawson Hitchpath, and some went as far as dumping the remains down outhouse systems when they'd appear on an unlucky woman's duvet. Historians claim the bones reappearing was nothing more than a prank played by bored miners or mischievous teenagers but it surely wouldn't be the only unruly haunting cascading down on Buckskin Joe during its heyday. Unfortunately for everyone, the golden Buckskin Joe didn't last forever. In fact, by 1866, most of the mines were totally depleted. The local mill had closed shop and the town itself was rapidly deserted. The miners moved on, their families with them, and the rest of the business folk found ventures elsewhere around the Western territories. The Buckskin Joe County Courthouse was moved to Fair Play, Colorado, the new seat to Park County, and most of its structures were left to ruin for decades. That is until 1957, when a man by the name of Carol Smith found assistance in resurrecting the ghost town of Buckskin Joe to its former glory. In California, Carol met Metro Golden Meyer art director Malcolm F. Brown and Royal Gorge Scenic Railway owner Don Tyner. The three men came together to rebuild the major building left at Buckskin Joe city limits on a plot of land 70 miles away from the original site. They also transported the old Tabor General Store from the old plot of Buckskin Joe, the lone surviving structure. The new Buckskin Joe became a popular tourist attraction and a movie set for Hollywood films. Major motion pictures shot at the regurgitated mining camp ranged from Cat Bayou and True Grit in the late 1960s to the Cowboys and Silverado in the 1970s and 1980s. When films weren't being shot on the premises, one could experience life in the Wild West as it originally was. There were gunfight simulations, ranching lessons, and of course, all things gold mining. It closed in the summer of 2011, after the owner announced it had been purchased. The purchaser ended up being billionaire William Koch, who transplanted the town once more to his private ranch in rural Colorado, making it inaccessible to the public for the final time. Meanwhile, back at the original location of the original Buckskin Joe, just the cemetery remained. Still littered with stones and grave markers, the markings in the cemetery leave historians to believe the town peaked in 1862, with a population around 3,000. It ended up featuring additional gambling halls, a few saloons, a newspaper, and even a traveling minstrel show, in addition to the banks and stores and courthouse that already stood tall. It was the quintessential mining town of the American frontier, left to rot to death as quickly as it came to life, leaving behind hardly anything but a few ghost stories and a lesson in the ever-changing landscape of the American dream. A 
A similar mining camp turned municipality turned ghost town can be found 900 miles north of Buckskin Joe, Colorado, and another former gold-laden mountain town called Garnett, Montana. Garnett's origins came first in 1865, when a few bootstrapped miners pursuing the first chance gulch discovered a precious gemstone called Garnett in the nearby mountain valleys, just east of Union Peak. These miners followed a few placer miners in the early 1860s, who turned up traces of these precious minerals and eventually struck gold as the decade transitioned to the 1870s. At the same time, as the miner numbers grew, so did the population of their mining camp in the foothills. At one point, there were 50 mines in the mountains surrounding the settlements, and none saw quite the expansion that Garnett saw going into the 1890s. In fact, Garnett actually wasn't called Garnett until 1895, when it was previously referred to as Mitchell, Montana. The miners camping in the immediate vicinity realized they had settled right on top of the Garnett Lode, where the gemstones were first found in bulk. Thus, the name changed to Garnett, and ironically enough, soon after the miners struck gold in the Nancy Hakes mine, and the entire mining operation shifted from Garnett to gold. In 1896, the gold from just the Nancy Hanks mine alone brought in close to $700,000, which is equivalent to $25.5 million today when adjusting for inflation. The money then recirculated right through the Garnett economy, and the town saw its biggest jump in population in 1898, with an estimated 1,200 citizens filling the town's four stores, 13 saloons, doctor's facilities, barber shops and hairdressers, a butcher shop for the local ranchers, a laundry facility, and four hotels. The saloons and hotels were especially hot spots for business, with passerby and gold purchasers renting a room for their lodging. Back in 1898, one could purchase a night's stay between $1 and $3, but even the poorer folks were not turned away. In the attic of J.K. Wells Hotel, guests who stayed for 25 cents would be placed in the windowless room but provided a cot and a meal. In a much drastic twist when compared to other mining settlements around the Westward Territories, Garnett featured more than just miners and the occasional female entertainer, but rather hosted an assortment of single folk, newlywed couples chasing their newfound American dream, and large families looking to raise a family away from the East Coast and Southern swamps and Western deserts. Due to the higher rates of young kin and family units, Garnett was the rare remote mining camp to feature an entire school. There wasn't another major settlement for tens of miles, and it required at least a three-day journey to travel there and gather vital supplies. Luckily, there was a stagecoach operation in Bearmouth, just to the south of Garnett, as well as larger supply chains in the closest municipality of Masula. Thus, the townsfolk of Garnett were mostly a happy bunch, the children filling the classrooms and streets in the summers, with husbands coming home to their wives from the mines in the evenings. If one snapped a photo of the average Garnett family, one would snap a photo of the average American family, as it was thought to be back when the remnants of Manifest Destiny still lingered in the vast countryside. Not only that, but the people of Garnett were primed with the top class of entertainment to exist in such a remote area of the United States. The town saw frequent parties held in ballrooms and in private residences, along with seasonal picnics, community-building fishing excursions, and of course, the usual card games and drink-filled celebrations at the local saloons. To this day, the story goes that because of the proliferation of family values in Garnett, the vices were kept mostly secret when the sun went down. Specifically, prostitution and gambling rings were never outwardly spoken about in the town, and the town jail was dangled over the heads of occasional drunkards, scaring them into sobriety. Thus, the locations of Garnett's vices were never unveiled, and a unique mystique now blankets where the saloons still stand. Unfortunately, even the small town magic of Garnett, Montana had to run out, as did the gold. By 1905, almost all of the 50 mines in the vicinity were completely emptied out, and only a couple hundred loyal residents remained in the old camp. These residents were then pushed away even more violently in 1912, when a fire swept through Garnett and razed nearly half the structures. In 1914, World War I took what few remaining young men still hung around the mines, and Garnett was all but ghosted completely. In a strange twist rarely seen across these types of forgotten mining towns around the Western territories, Garnett didn't stay dead for long. 
1934, prospectors and miners alike flocked back to Garnett when President Theodore Roosevelt signed the Emergency Banking Act back in March of 1933, ultimately raising the price of gold from around $16 an ounce to around $35 an ounce. Like old times, though, the second Garnett gold rush was short-lived. World War II wound up pulling away the young folk from the mining camp, just like World War I had, and by the mid-1940s, Garnett received ghost town status once more, but this time for eternity. Yet not all remained quiet in the quaint abandoned mining camp. In the 1970s, after Garnett had been robbed of all of its antique innards, preservationists moved through what was left of the town in an effort to save the old-time atmosphere and imagery the Garnett still conveyed. The movement was nicknamed the Garnett Preservation Association, and the endeavor saved at least 30 buildings, including the infamous J.K. Wells Hotel, the Kelly Saloon, and Davies Store. Due to the successes of the preservation movement, Garnett is now a stable attraction for tourists and ghost hunters from around the United States, seeing as many as 16,000 visitors per year. Legend has it that one can hear retro piano music and the sound of crowds laughing emanating from the walls of Kelly's saloon. There's also rumors of unexplained footsteps tapping above the first floor of J.K. Wells' hotel, but only when the listener is stationed on the outside. One might think Garnett, Montana is like any other ghost town propped up across the West, made unoriginal for commercial profits and fastened with the same old boring touristy ideals with trick lights and hidden speakers propped to try a faux authentication at reliving the Old West. But that's what separates the remote mining camp from others, like Buckskin Joe. There are no companies or major brands lurking behind a welcome center when you arrive in Garnett. All that remains are what was left in the 1940s, sans looted pieces of furniture. So if you ever make it to the Garnett turn gold slice of paradise, what you see, and maybe even hear, is real. 160 year ghosts in the making. The story of Freeman Junction dates back beyond recorded history and into the era when white settlers weren't even on the conscience of Native Americans and their tribes that dominated the tops of mountain ranges and the bottoms of expansive deserts, in the region now known as present-day California of the United States. What is known as Kern County now was originally a junction of indigenous trails through a spring in the desert. Native Americans used it as a campsite, as hinted at by the presence of bedrock mortars littered around the vicinity that date back before colonization. The land remained free from cowboys and miners all the way until 1834, when a mountain man and exploratory scout by the name of Joseph R. Walker happened upon the junction spring after climbing the Sierra Nevada mountain range and charting the pass now attributed to his namesake called the Walker Pass. While the area seemed ripe for settlement, Joseph R. Walker wasn't the type to establish camp and sit down for long periods of time. Rather, the legendary scout continued west and left the hidden promises of the desert junction for the next lucky straggler. Those folks wouldn't arrive until the winter of 1849 and 1850, when a few parties attempting to capitalize on the California gold rush got trapped in the relentless infinity of Death Valley and nearly lost their way stumbling around the Sierra Nevadas. However, while they stopped in the junction, the 49ers didn't stay for long, as the lust for gold still stood strong in February of 1850, and they moved on to the gold fields that supposedly laid ahead. It wasn't until sometime in late 1873, or even early 1874, when a member of those 49er mining parties, by the name of Freeman S. Raymond, returned to the desert junction to build a stagecoach station, right where Walker Pass Road split off to the main road, leading to Los Angeles, California, and connecting mine traffic to the nearby locales. Soon, Freeman Junction was officially homesteaded, and despite being of minuscule size in terms of land, it formed a vital community for the miners in the desert and their families in the surrounding villages. Not all was blissful in Freeman Junction, however. Not long after Raymond finished his stagecoach station called Coyote Holes, the infamous Californian bandit Debercio Vasquez made his presence known in the Kern County municipality. It was on the 25th of February, 1874, when Vasquez and a ragtag team of fellow outlaws charged Freeman Junction and robbed various crews working on freight wagons at Coyote Holes. They had been watching Freeman Junction for days from a secret hideout called Robber's Roost, located not far in Scotty Mountain foothills. As Vasquez and company made their escape, 
they wasted no time robbing an arriving stagecoach of all its wealth before shooting one of the workers and making haste back into the desert from which they came. Nevertheless, Raymond made right with the robbery victims and continued operating coyote holes and keeping Freeman Junction afloat. In 1890, a post office was built next to the stage station, and the settlement continued to offer assistance to desert and mountain travelers for years. That is until August 1909, when Freeman Raymond passed away and left his junction to the homesteaders still living on the land. Their peace was infantile, however, when a tribe of local Native Americans used Raymond's passing as an opportunity to claim what was once their ancestors' homeland. Later in 1909, the indigenous folk burned down the stage station and post office and scared the few lingering homesteaders who departed for nearby towns. The land was never fully reclaimed by the Native Americans, though, and the junction lay dormant for over a decade. In the 1920s, further attempts at homesteading Freeman Junction were underway, most notably by Mr. and Mrs. Claire C. Miley. Their efforts weren't totally unsuccessful, as they eventually opened up a gas station and auto mechanic shop outside of their stone cabin at the center of town. Enough folks joined the Miley couple to start plans for a new post office to be built in 1953, but those talks fell through when Freeman Junction could no longer economically support itself. Without a sensible way to retrieve their mail, Freeman Junction citizens slowly departed the town for more modernized communities. In June of 1978, the town was officially declared dead, and what was remaining from the long-forgotten structures were torn down to make way for the Los Angeles aqueduct. The last symbol of Freeman Junction comes in a California historical landmark situated off California Route 178. Even though Freeman Junction disappeared on a physical level, its tragic and complicated history stands as a symbol of what happened to so many minuscule towns and stagecoach stations around the West. It also serves as an important reminder that these lands were not originally granted to the white colonizers who have dominated the country over the last 300 years. While the indigenous communities have lost most of their sovereignty, not all who attempted to rock the Native American's foundation lived to tell the tale, nor did the towns that failed to protect them making all who suffered in the junction not just prisoners of Freeman, but rather prisoners of karmic consequence. These are the true footprints of the frontier. <laughs>